There we go. So welcome everyone to this introductory webinar for course number five of 2023 for the Police Online Assessment Centre. More about what that involves in a moment. Uh, you're all extremely welcome this evening. I know some of you are just guesting and others are actually part of the course because I can recognise you from previous courses that you've been on. So what's going to happen this evening? Um, we're not going to be able to do any welcomes because there's two screens worth of you. I think there's over 30 of you here. Wow, incredible. Um, so we won't be able to do any introductions because we'd spend an hour just doing introductions. But as the course moves along, for those of you who are still with us, uh, we'll get to know you, especially on Thursday evening, a little bit more about you. What we're going to cover this evening, we're going to cover the online assessment centre, the reality behind it. We're also going to look at um, how we can approach each one of the exercises in the online assessment centre in a way that's going to secure you 90% plus. Um, th this is doable, by the way. If any of you are thinking, no, nah, that's never going to happen, 90% plus, this is absolutely doable. Uh, let's just get a show of hands. Who's up for who wants a score of 90% plus in their online assessment centre? Give me a big... All right, OK. All of you. Brilliant. Well, that's what we're going to focus on. Um, and I'll tell you in a moment why it's so important that we aim for a high mark. I get a lot of people in the Blue Light Facebook group. Let's just let Archie in. A lot of, oh, and Chloe. Um, I get a lot of people in the Blue Light Facebook group saying things like, what's the pass mark? It's irrelevant what the pass mark is. If I told you it was 80% or 50% or 60%, it wouldn't mean anything to you anyway, would it? It's just a meaningless, arbitrary number. All you need to do is score better than everyone else, which is why we go for a score of 90% plus. And there's another reason why uh, we go for that. And I'll show, share the information about why you need to aspire to a really high marking moment. So we're going to look at how we're going to approach each one of the exercises to ensure we get that really high mark. Um, and also, for those of you who are actually part of the course, we're going to look at what you need to do to prepare for Thursday. Because on Thursday, you're going to be doing some interview practice. And I need to make sure that you are clear about exactly what you need to do to prepare for that and what you need to do to prepare for next Tuesday and Thursday, where we're going to look at the two different stage threes, the stage three written and the stage three uh, briefing. Um, so there we go. That's what this evening is. It will probably take about an hour, if that's OK. Uh, that for those of you who are actually on the online course thinking, hey, I signed up for two hour long webinars. Do not worry. The webinars that we do for the rest of the programme will be longer than two hours. I can pretty much guarantee that, especially when we get to the stage three. Uh, before we continue, does anyone have any really big questions, any burning questions that they have? If you have a question, you can just wave your hand in the air. Um, I may not be able to see you because I'm across two screens at the moment. So if I ever say, um, has anyone got any questions, it might be better if you just raise your hand or use the ele ele electronic thing. Um, so I know Michaela's got a question. Uh, Daniel, uh, let's open up the floor to Daniel for a moment and he, uh, with his big question. Go on, Daniel. Uh, hi. Hi, Daniel. Uh, I just enjoyed the course a couple of days ago hi. and I will have my assessment in a couple of weeks, two weeks. And uh, I'm struggling a little bit with uh, some value and uh, I need a little bit uh, some advice if uh, I'm in the right way or uh, I need to change uh, the approach. We will cover this when you're talking about values. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing you mean for the interview phase. We will have a look at that as we get to the interface part of the interview part of the uh, webinar this evening, if that's okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Daniel. Um, don't forget, just, you know, when I say, has anyone got any other questions about the interview phase? Hit me with that question. Okay. Um, Michaela, Michaela, question from yourself. Hello, hi, okay. Um, we had actually yesterday the preparation session with one of the GMP recruitment. Mm -hmm. And basically, I don't know, because I think you mentioned before that the written exercise is not recorded. But according to what he said yesterday, he said everything is recorded, even the written exercise. So, no. 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 Definitely not. I'll put money on that. I'll put a thousand pounds to a charity of your choice on that. Uh, these are my old colleagues from GMP. Um, they, I love them. I think they're great, but sometimes they're not full of the best information. 
Yeah, I was a bit surprised because when you, I don't know, I'm like to make my notes and stuff. So I was like, they will record me all the time while I'm doing the, my notes and stuff like that. So it was, no. No, definitely, definitely not recorded. Uh, the written exercise is not recorded. I can, uh, like I said, I put a thousand pounds to a charity of your choice on that. All right. Um, <laughs> you it's it's not been recorded ever since the online assessment center started now four forces do this they're doing the very best they can to try and help you but that honestly because i know how it works they're sort of scraping around trying to find people is there anyone that can do this input uh well i think i've done something similar once or i think i sat in on one i, I might be able to do it for you and were well, you working uh oh yeah i'll see if i can get some time out from uh you can ask my sergeant if i can have a better time out that's just how it works michaela I can absolutely promise you, you're not being recorded. Yeah, no, because it was three hour session yesterday. So it was like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> did did those three hours cover anything like the detail that we've covered so far? Because I know Michaela has been on some of my webinars before. Uh, to be fair, he went a little bit into details, like mm. trying to give us like some kind of examples, but it wasn't too deep as you covering. So it was some of the details were there, but you doing much deeper yeah absolutely really 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 much deeper yeah. <laughs> yeah awesome did it give you any insight into what the exercises would be in the stage threes or anything like that uh basically he said everything i already know, knew from you so basically what are you covering in your like uh, webinars basically yeah. that's what he said and only the thing which uh i was a bit surprised was about the written exercises recorded which I know, I know you mentioned it's not. So that's I thought I'm going to ask you today. That's fine. I promise you, it's not recorded. Uh, they've just got that wrong. Um, sometimes forces also say things like, uh, even though um, it's not being recorded, uh, they may do a quality check on you and uh, uh, turn on your camera just to check on you. No, they won't. It, it, that's never happened, and it never will. There's not a team of um ninja assessors at college of policing headquarters in Wrighton, um ready to uh, check on what you're doing at three o'clock in the morning and besides which you'd need a you'd need a chief officer a chief officer's authority to do that because it's intrusive surveillance no i was you know because when you're writing like that so you will be like that on your computer writing so they will really look at you that way well, they're, they're not they're, they're not looking at you it's just they're, get out of your head michaela there's no camera that's it. Okay. Good. Thank you. All right. One more question from Reese and then we'll push on. Hi, Brendan. Um, hey, I've signed up to your online uh, webinars. However, due to my shift pattern at the prison, I generally am not out until eight o'clock. I've been looking at your past webinars, but obviously, when I want to look at them and progress on the things that you have set out myself, I can't then go back to you and sort of discuss it and go through it with you because obviously when the webinars are, I'm never around. And I'm feeling that this is going to be a continuous trend for me right. as a stumbling block going forward. Okay, well, all I can say is do your best to get onto the webinars if you can, because you're on this one. Awesome. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this, uh, is one... this is why I provide previous recordings of webinars so you can sort of geek out on all, all the ones that have gone before. Now we're on course five at the moment. For those of you who've got access to the webinars, I'd recommend you look at the webinars from course number two and course number three, and particular course number four, because I think course number four had the most up-to-date information in it. And I thought they just the course four just ran really well. And I think the course four briefing exercise that we did in particular last Thursday um, ran really well. And so I'm very, very pleased with um, how those webinars worked out and the amount of input everyone put into it. So, Reese, I hope you can make some of, some of the webinars over the next week or two. Uh, but if you can't, then there's recordings available. Um, if you're really, really stuck and you're really, really pushed and you're thinking, I absolutely want to get some one-to-one -one work with Brendan, uh, that's I'm not going to be able to do it in a webinar. I'll have to do it one-to-one. -one. Then, uh, you know, give me a shout out, give me a message, and we can work something out. There's a one-to-one -one service on the website, but it won't cost as much for you because you're already a client. All right, thank you. All right, okay, let's push on. Thank you, Reese. Thank you. All right, so some of you, uh, you can probably tell there's a familiarity between people like Michaela and myself because she's been on these webinars before and she's continuing to um, do all she can, and others of you doing all you can to make sure that you're fully up to date with all the information that you need to ensure you get 90% plus. Um, but some of you don't know me. Um, you might know me from the Facebook group that you're part of. 
So, and if you're watching this on the replay, if you want to check what he's talking about, the Facebook group, uh, over 20,000 of us, I think there's over 21,000 getting on for 22,000. How is it, by the way? How is that Facebook group? Is it thumbs up or is it thumbs down? Thumbs up, awesome stuff. So if you're not a member of that group and you watch this on the recording, check the links below, you'll find a link to the Facebook group. Come and join us. Um, so you've probably just seen me from, from there. Um, I've been in the police already, uh, unlike a lot of people who do this kind of thing, who have never been in the police before, they've never had a warrant card in the pocket. Um, I joined the police in 1985. Yes, I am that old. And I served for 28 years in two, uh, three different forces, sorry. Uh, started in the Cheshire Constabulary, then I went to the Bermuda Police, and then I went to Greater Manchester Police. And yes, it was awesome in Bermuda. And yes, we did wear shorts. Um, it was just fantastic, fantastic opportunity. Going from there to Manchester was interesting. Um, so, but in Manchester, I got really, really interested in coaching and supporting people to succeed in promotion boards, specialist interviews. I went into student officer training. I became a trainer of trainers. Went back to university, did the master's in education. Completely geeked out on things like this competence and values framework for policing. Um, th this was this sort of thing was my bedtime reading. I was that exciting to be with. Um, and, and for the past so for the past twenty eight years, I've been continuing to coach and support people to succeed, not just in the recruitment process, but also in specialist interviews and promotion boards, all the way up to superintendent. So there's probably about my conservative guess is through all the webinars, the one to ones, the seminars I've run, the certificate of knowledge and policing that we used to run years ago, ran that for about two and a half thousand students um, who pretty much nearly all of them are in the police. A conservative guesstimate is about 15,000 people who are in the police as a result of my support. So it, that, this is something that drives me, that really pushes me to continue to, uh, to help you succeed in the process because although this is my living, what I really love is every day I get a message or an email or a phone call, something to say, I've passed, I've scored the highest marks, I got through everything first time. Uh, at the end of my interview, the final interview, they said to me, look, we'll get the official notification in a few days time, but can I just share with you that interview is exceptional, you're in, and I hope you'll be on my team in the future. You know, that's the stuff I love. I thrive on that. It gives me a sense of purpose. It, it really appeals to the values, something in there. So that's why I love to do what I do. That's why I get a bit overexcited about it as well, because I know uh, there's a lot of hard work to do. You know, I'll show you the way, but you've got to do the hard work. There is no magic bullet, folks. There is no, you're not going to succeed in this process by osmosis. You're going to succeed in this process by preparing and practicing and doing the things I ask you to do. In terms of the online assessment center, history behind it, uh, prior to the online assessment center, uh, what the College of Policing had was a face-to-face -face assessment center called the Search Assessment Center. I can't remember what it stands for, but this was something that had been knocking around for about 10 years. It didn't have an awfully good reputation um, because it put you in, it made you do role plays and put you into a role play situation where you'd role play a customer services officer for a shopping center, the Westshire Shopping Center. Um, and the role plays would have about 15 lines and they'd show no emotion whatsoever. And it was the same thing that they'd been running for years. Forces didn't like it. College of Policing didn't even like it. The biggest problem was, was for some reason, it discriminated against people who were visibly ethnic, especially if you were black. You were not just likely to fail it by a couple of percentage points. It was like something like 44% of everyone who was black passed it versus something like 70% of everyone who was white British. You know, it, there was something horribly wrong with it. And that problem still exists with the online assessment centre as an aside, but not to the same extent. And then along came COVID and they couldn't run those anymore. So they had to come up with a solution. And what the College of Policing did is they cobbled up a solution called the online assessment centre. Um, I thought it would have some face-to-face -face interaction in it. That was my prediction when they first said that this is what they're going to develop because they couldn't stop police recruitment because when COVID came, it came just about five months after the government had launched their 20,000 uplift. So the government had to continue with that uplift program. The police still needed to recruit people. The police couldn't just close down and be furloughed like other organisations did. Uh, they had to keep going with that function. They had to keep recruiting. 
And so the pressure was on the College of Policing to come up with something. They came up with the Online Assessment Centre. I'll tell you a little bit more about the detail of what that involves in a moment, but basically it is exactly what it says on the side of the tin. It is an online assessment centre. I thought this was going to be temporary, but it's not. We're, we're well out of COVID now, and they're still operating it for some odd, odd reason. Um, but it is what it is. I suspect it's because they don't, have, don't have the resources to develop a face-to-face -face process. And because it's cheap, it's a lot cheaper to run than face-to-face -face assessment centres. So my guess is for those reasons and a variety of others, uh, including the fact that Uplift has put a lot of pressure on the police service to recruit, that that's why we've still got the online assessment centre. So because it's all online, there is no human contact whatsoever. Zero human contact. This is, because I've been doing this now for 28 years, this is the most tick box formulaic assessment process I've ever seen in the police service. And I've seen lots of different assessment processes for promotion boards, for specialist interviews, for the recruit process over the years. This is by far the most tick box process to pass. If you're thinking this is my opportunity to show my motivation, my enthusiasm, my values, then no, this is not the right time. The online assessment center is about you ticking boxes. And I think that's a really sad reflection on the police service at the moment, especially because of the situation that the police service is in, in terms of legitimacy and trust and the scandals that just keep emerging and emerging and emerging. And the very fact that you can still join some forces without any form of human contact is beyond me, absolutely beyond me. But it's a great opportunity for you. It's an awesome opportunity for you because if you learn how to tick the boxes and tick them well, then you are guaranteed to get a high score at the assessment center. You can't fail. You can't fail it. Um, it's that formulaic. Let's just let Megan in the room. Um, so let's just go, right. So what does it involve then and why is it so formulaic? Well, um, the first part of the assessment process now is something that they've introduced only recently over the past year, which is the National SIFT. Just to give me an idea, how many of you have done the National SIFT? That's just about most of you. So, uh, and let's just give me another show of hands. How many of you are actually in a position where you are ready to do your online assessment centre or you've got a date to do it or you're actually in your online assessment centre week? So, <laughs> oh, all hands to the pumps, that's a lot of you. All right, okay. Um, so I won't tell you too much about the National SIFT then. The National SIFT replaced the application form. So most of you just completed an application form, which basically just asks for who you are, where you are, what your date of birth is, where do you live, a little bit about your background, and then that's it. Uh, gone of all the, all the difficult questions about why do you want to join the police or what impact do you think it's going to have on your life. Uh, some forces like British Transport Police may, may still use that, Ministry of Defence Police, Civil Nuclear Constabulary, Police Scotland. Um, but for most forces in England and Wales, where the online assessment centre applies, there's nothing more to the application form than that. They put you through the national SIFT. That's the equivalent of the application form now. And from there, you go into the online assessment centre. And that turnaround can be quite quick. How many of you have had a turnaround from notification of passing national SIFT to getting your dates for the online assessment centre within a week? Uh, hands up if that's happened to any of you. So quite not, but probably about a, th uh, about a third of you. All right. So the, the turnaround can be quite quick, depending on the force. And this is why we need to start preparing for the online assessment centre, not in your assessment centre week. Although if you're in your assessment centre week, all is not lost. So the first stage, uh, and this is depending on the force, the first stage is a situational judgment test, very similar to the one that's in the national SIFT. Although I suspect now, by now, most forces have got rid of the situational judgment test because you've just done one that's harder in the national SIFT. So I'm not going to go into that in too much detail because it's in a gradual state of being withdrawn because it's pointless getting you to do a national SIFT that's got a situational judgment test in it and a behavioural styles questionnaire in it. And then to take you into an online assessment process, which then gives you another situational judgment test, which is actually easier than the one on the national SIFT. So we're going to jump straight ahead to the next stage, which is the stage two interview. Oh, and by the way, as an aside, 
you'll find this, those of you who know me know I go off all sorts of tangents and all sorts of asides. But as an aside, um, all of you will have been sent this, the Competency and Values Framework for Policing. Yeah, you've all been sent a copy of this. Hands up, have you been sent a copy of this by your respective force? All right, that's uh, probably about half. Actually, some of you haven't. Wow. All right, that's most of you, but some of you haven't. Your force should have sent you a copy of this. Also, the guidance on the online assessment centre from the College of Policing, which, um, if I'm honest, is about 20 or 30 pages of stuff that they could have squeezed into two pages. But that's the College of Policing for you. You know, why say in two pages what you can say in 30? Um, and the competency and values framework is something that's very similar. Now, before we continue, here's a little test for you. Can any of you, and go on, be bold if you can explain it, uh, don't be shy. Can any of you explain what this wheel of confusion is all about? It's in the competency and values framework. If you've, if you've read it, you must be able to understand it because surely the College of Policing wouldn't have put something out that's um, complicated and confusing. Would they? Would they do that? <laughs> I've worked for them and with them on four occasions during my career. I was a trainer for National Police Training, which was College of Policing as it is now. I was also a trainer of trainers for National Police Training. Uh, Blue Light Consultancy was the biggest deliverer of the Certificate of Knowledge in Policing as an approved College of Policing provider about eight years ago. And I've also worked for the Organisational Development Unit in the College of Policing as an associate. Did that for about two years, just because it was good wheeze and very, very interesting to do. Uh, so I've worked with them and for them on four different occasions. What I can share with you about them is they're really nice people. Honestly, they are really, really nice people. I loved working with them. I loved working alongside them. Um, lovely people, but they've got a tendency to have zero common sense, zero sense of reality of policing about probably the majority of them have never been in a police station before and they're, they're really really intelligent which is why they come out with stuff like this they presume that everyone else in the world knows what they're on about and they don't and this is conversations i've had with them before is that you know you're all lovely people but quite honestly don't use big words like that because in the policing world they're just going to look at you and think you're strange yes but it's a you know it's a a stakeholder process that's based on the principles of hermeneutic dialectic. <laughs> no, stop, don't do that. <laughs> it's, you're just going to confuse everyone. You're doing it again. You're, you're being too clever um, in a nice way. So, um, all right, I'm going to suggest you do something with this because uh, I'll tell you what, let me just run a few things off for you. Um, you might be thinking, oh, I'm going to have to have a, an answer for each one of the competencies or values, or I need to understand all of this so I can answer all the questions. No, you don't. You really don't. You're just going to get confused because you're going to see that behaviours around decision making are mentioned in transparency, which is a value. They're mentioned also in impartiality, which is a value. And in the competence you've analysed critically. So can anyone explain to me why decision making as a behaviour is in three different values and competencies? Anyone? No? What, can anyone explain why the, the values, decision making as a value, is at just one level? Because values are only at one level, but competence is at three. So there's three different levels of making decisions in the competence you've analysed critically, but not in impartiality and not transparency. Can anyone explain that to me? No? Can anyone explain what on earth the competency of innovative and open-minded is really, really about? Because some of you are worrying, and I was thinking, I've got to think of a time when I've been innovative. No, you don't. That, that competency should have been called renamed uh, reflective learning, because that's what it's about. It's not about being innovative. So my advice to all of you, if you've got a copy of this and you're really puzzled about it, and you're following all the advice in the Facebook group, like just learn your competencies, you'll be fine. It's the worst advice ever. You're never going to learn this. I've got a master's in education. I went back to university to study for a master's in education. I, I focused on this. I geeked out on it. I was on the National Standards and Qualification Steering Group for two years. We never anticipated that this would happen. I don't understand it. And I'll leave you into another secret. I've not met a serving police officer that understands it, including the ones that might be assessing you in your final interview. So my advice for you is take this and get a bin and drop it in the bin because you're absolutely not going to need it. Follow my advice and guidance, and the competencies, the behaviours, will fall out the sky. Trust me, they will. They absolutely will. They absolutely will. 
Um, another reason why, before we go on to stage two, another reason why I want you to focus on getting 90% plus, um, because we're at the end of the uplift now. If you're watching this on the recording, it's something like the 7th of March. Actually, it's not something like the 7th of March. It is the 7th of March, isn't it? It is actually the 7th of March today, uh, 2023. The 20,000 uplift finishes at the end of March. That's why you're seeing in the Facebook group people saying things like, I've got a start date of the 31st of March. You know, because if they don't get you through the door on that day, they lose the funding. And actually, they have to pay the College of Policing. I've heard uh, figures of anything, sorry, not College of Policing, you have to pay the government back for every seat they don't fill, which is part of their target. They've got to pay the government back, I think it's anything between 18,000 and 24,000 uh, pounds per person that they don't put on one of those seats. So they've been in a huge rush to get people through the door, which means that it's not been as competitive as it has been in the past to join the police. This is going to change because in April, we're going to see that forces are going to have recruitment falling off a cliff edge. We've already seen, we're already seeing it now, forces saying that the March intake now uh, might be in September or um, you've passed everything, uh, but we'll let you know when the intake day will be, the date will be, it'll be sometime in the autumn. Some forces, Derbyshire, have been telling people your start date will be sometime in 2024, over a year away. And so what's going to happen is people are going to start getting put into talent pools. Uh, this is where everyone who's passed gets put into, it's exactly what it says on the side of a tin, a talent pool. Uh, they've used these before. They used these before the uplift. These have been used for years, uh, especially post-austerity, when they had to cut back on recruitment, but not completely. So they'd have far more applicants than they would places. Um, South Wales Police used them, uh, Surrey used them, Humberside used them, just about every force used them. And what would happen is you, you'd get put in that talent pool as an individual who's passed. And as the intakes get agreed, and the numbers in those intakes get agreed, they would invite people out of that talent pool. But because of a stated case um, to do with the Cheshire Constabulary, um, where it all went, went to the High Court, it was a... Um, a case where Cheshire Constabulary were challenged about a recruitment policy they had. Um, because of that, and rightly so, the only way they can take you out of that talent pool isn't based on what Cheshire were doing, which is we need more women, we need more people who are from an ethnic background or people who have different religions, not, not um, uh, the, the atypical ones in this country. Uh, that's what Cheshire were doing, and that was challenged. And the court, court said, you can't do that. You can't treat just everyone as having a pass. If you're going to select people out of that pool, you, you can only select them based on their scores. Because every pass isn't equal. Every pass in your line assessment centre is not equal. Um, you will get scored on it. And if, I, if what happened years ago happens again, is if your score is just a pass, you might find yourself in that talent pool for a long time. Because as you're sitting in that talent pool with a low mark, although it's a pass, there's other people coming into it who've got high marks and then they're being taken out before you. It is not a first come, first served. It, it, even though they may tell, tell you that, it doesn't work like that. I've been doing this for years. I've seen my clients in the past who have, before they've come to me, got just a mediocre mark and have ended up in a talent pool. And the only way out for them has been to apply to join a different force, do an assessment centre with them, score really highly, and then notify their force that they want to join where they are in a talent pool of their new score and they've been taken out. Is that making sense to everyone? Yeah, I know it's, I know it's not what you, what you want to hear, but the uplift's finished. There's no one in this room here who is going to get in by the end of March. It's just not physically possible for that to happen uh, because you've got to go through vetting, final interview, medical, um, all the background checks. It's just not going to happen. So you're in a competitive world now, highly, highly competitive. Everyone I've spoken to in recruitment has said that even though things are going to be difficult, even though we're going to have a, like an austerity too, we're not going to stop recruiting. So that's the good news because um, a lot of forces I've spoken to have said the biggest mistake they made was to stop recruiting during austerity because quite a few forces stopped recruiting for like three or four years. Uh, forces like Greater Manchester Police, my old force, recruited 40 a year. That's four zero. And that was from their special constabulary and PCSOs. 40 
is a drop in the ocean. It's it's nothing. It's about two officers, two or three officers per division in Manchester, which was absolutely nothing. So what forces have realised though is they've got to keep on recruiting. They can't just stop. So it won't be quite as bad as austerity one, but we're certainly in austerity two. Then that's why we've got to get that high mark. Is that making sense to everyone? Give me a thumbs up if it's making sense. All right. Give me a thumbs down if you don't like it though. <laughs> you don't have to like it though. It just is what it is. Okay. Um, let's take a question. So Iwalina has got a question. I think. Or maybe not. Hello. Hello. Hey, how are you doing? Hi, hi. I'm good, how are you? Um, yes, I'm, I'm, I have a question because um, if you pass the online assessment and they tell you, um, well, you, you go further for like an interview, because like for the med, for example, you have the uh, one day one assessment at the center. Uh, I, oh, I read about it, or BTP has like another interviews and they will be put in a talent pool. So for example, like if you pass the online assessment, it's apparently about it for two years, so you can transfer over to a different course. Yeah. But if you get transferred over and they say you have this interview, you pass it, and they say there is, because there is a lot of people uh, applying same position and they don't they have they have already have filled uh, their places so you have to wait until the next time available so can you like um, transfer to a different folder instead like waiting for such a long time to actually get employed yeah you know okay, that's I mean? good, good question that um so i would highly recommend that you do that that you apply for as many forces as you can if you're geographically able to do so even though some forces will say to you, you can only apply to one force at, at a time. That's an old rule yeah, from two years ago. That's what they say. You can only yeah. apply for one, yeah. But that's, a, that's just a made up thing from about two or three years ago. Um, the College of oh. Police have changed that rule two years ago. Quote, quote that back to them, um, but just apply anyway. You can't do an online assessment centre um, twice mm -hmm. in a six month period. So yeah. you can't apply to two forces and do an online assessment centre with each one. Uh, they'll be able to track you through your national insurance number anyway, and they won't allow you to do it. Um, but you can apply to other forces. There are, the College of Policing rules were really clear. You can apply to as many forces as you want. One of my clients has got eight applications in. Actually, is he had eight applications in. He's now got start. He's, no, he's gone beyond the start date now. He's now actually in. He picked one force out of those eight. He was successful in every one of them. Um, the issue you're going to have, though, is the online assessment centre opens the door to be able to apply to another force if they're accepting transfer scores. They don't have to accept this transfer score if they don't want to. They may uh, make you, if you've not done the National SIFT already, which some of you may not have done, if you've got a pass in your, well, no, not no, not for yourself, but if some people may have a pass in the online assessment centre, but they've not done the more recently um, introduced National SIFT, so they make you do that. If you've got a national SIF passed and an online assessment centre pass, you might be able to transfer your score to another force, but they will make you do whatever their final interview is or final assessment process is. So let's say for the Metropolitan Police, there's no interview. You just do two role plays, which is bizarre, but it is what it is. So play, yeah. if, you've, if you've done those two role plays and you've got a pass and you're thinking, actually, I'd like to broaden my horizons, you could apply to join Kent or Essex or any other force, Thames Valley, but they would make you do their final interview. So you've got to do their final interview or their assessment process, which could involve briefings, role plays, uh, entry exercises, presentations, group exercises, all sorts of weird and wonderful stuff because forces can make up their own final final assessment. Is that okay. does that a question, Iwalina? So, um, yes, yeah, so the, the online assessment. So if I pass the online assessment and they said you need to go for a final interview and I fail the final interview, or let's say with the Met, like the role play, whatever, because every force has a different final, different different way of uh, having the final interview. If I fail the one, can I still transfer the online assessment to another force and try with, with them instead? Yes, you can. Yeah. Even though some forces may say you can't reapply to us for three months or six months, which is just an arbitrary number. I've asked, I've asked people in recruitment, why three months? Why six months? And the best they can come up with is, well, it just seems about right. 
you know, it's not the law or anything, it's just made up stuff. So even though that force may say you can't reapply to us in a three, for another three months or six months, that doesn't stop you going to a neighbouring force and saying, hey, I've got a passing my online assessment centre. You don't have to tell them that you've failed with another force, but if they ask you, you should tell them because of honesty and integrity. Uh, but it will still put you through their process. So it will put you through whatever they've got as a final thing. And But the other thing to say, Walina, is if you're going for the Met and you've got role plays after the online assessment centre, there's no excuse for failing the role plays because all you need to do is follow my script. Follow my role play script. You will pass. You can't fail. It's impossible to fail. Use my role play script. Use the Cutter system for managing role plays. You can't fail. Not one of my clients has failed the role plays. Full stop. Oh, okay. But in case if you do, can you still transfer over to another year four then? Yes. Yeah, but you won't. You won't fail the role oh, plays. Yeah. My guy, you will pass. You're not going to be the first, yeah. Evelina. You will not be yeah. the first. Not one person. <laughs> not one person. Yeah. And this goes back because the Met have been using role plays now for years. Not one of my clients has failed the role plays. Full stop. It's uh, role play is not my is my is not my biggest strength. Not anyone's biggest strength, but you won't fail. Just learn my script and deliver that script, and you can't fail. That's another okay. webinar, though. That is another webinar. Okay. okay. Right. Let's push on. Thanks, Ivelino. Okay. Thank you. Let's push on. Um, uh, there's quite a few questions in the chat function. I'll take some of those at the next round of questions. All right. Stage two interview. This is uh, this is getting into the meaty good stuff. With stage two interview. They call it an interview, but an interview is when two people talk with each other. So I ask a question, someone else answers it. I then listen to that answer, and then I ask another question based on what their reply was, or I might probe that answer. That's an interview. This isn't, although they call it a stage two interview. There's no one there. You are delivering an interview answer to a camera, your camera, on your computer screen or on your device. But you're going to be asked questions. So you can deliver an answer um, on um, the values of integrity, public service, and transparency, and the competences of we take ownership and we are innovative and open-minded. Now, fortunately for all of you who are my clients who are on the course, you've got access to this, which is my handy question bank, uh, complete with instructions about how to actually structure your answers. Now, so listen in for those of you, and I know there's several of you here because I recognize you. Uh, listen in because I'm going to tell you about what we're going to be doing on Thursday evening as well, Thursday evening, where we're going to practice the interview answers. So how do I know it's those values and competencies? Well, it's in the guidance from the College of Policing. Are they going to change it? No, they're not, because they'd have to issue completely different guidance. They'd have to change all the questions. All of their assessors would then have to go to workshops on how to answer or oh, sorry, assess all of the answers to those questions, they're not going to do it. What they might do is tinker around with some of the questions, but I think what they're probably going to do is stick to the questions that are in this question bank. Um, so how are they going to do that? What's going to happen is you're going to get a Mrs. Woman, and it is a woman, who's going to explain to you how this assessment will work. You'll be given the opportunity to test your camera to make sure it's working. Test your camera before the assessment, by the way. Make sure this is one of the things that we do on our workshops. Uh, and it happened last week. I get everyone to do an introduction. And that's what will happen on Thursday. Everyone do an introduction. One, just to find out who you are, where you are, when's your online assessment centre. That's all I want to know, not what your favourite pizza topping is or any, where you like to go on holiday. Although I'm sure that's very interesting. Um, but what, uh, the other thing I'm really interested in is making sure that your equipment's working. So Iwalina, you know, I could only just make you out, but I think you're on a bus or something, so that's okay. Uh, but last week we had someone whose um, sound wasn't working. Their sound just wasn't working. And we couldn't hear anything they were saying. The last thing you want is to get feedback from the College of Policing to say you failed two of the exercises because we couldn't hear you and we can't lip read. So you need to make sure that your kit's working before you actually do this. So although they're gonna test it to make sure it's working on the day, do it before make sure it's working beforehand so that'll happen and then they'll tell you what's going to happen which is basically you will be asked one question from each one of those values and competencies you will have one minute to make notes 
or think about what your answer is going to be. And then you will have five minutes to deliver your answer. Five minutes to deliver your answer. And you can't press the pause button. There's no sort of, oh, okay, I'll just have one more than one minute. It, it just flows from one to the other. You've got that one minute and then five minutes. Uh, and that's just it. There's no way around it. There's no way around that. So once you've delivered your five minute answer, it'll just cut you off. And then it'll roll into the next question where you'll be asked the next question. It'll come up on the screen as well. There'll be some supplementary points that you need to cover in your answer. And then again, five minute, one minute to make notes, five minutes to deliver your answer. And that'll happen for five questions. So the whole thing will be done, dusted and over in the space of about 30 minutes. Space of about 30 minutes. Now you might be thinking uh, from my valuable um, question bank, which I'm told the questions are pretty much the questions that you're going to be asked um, from a variety of ethical sources, including forces that have done some work for in terms of positive action. I'm pretty much aware of what the questions are going to be. It's not hard to work them out anyway. You know, any question around transparency is always going to have something to do with decision making, excuse me. Any question around integrity is going to be around doing the right thing or uh, integrity, uh, doing the right thing or professionalism. <coughs> um, okay, well, I'll come to you after if that's okay. Yep. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So we can pretty much predict what the question is going to be. Um, and because I understand the behaviours within those competences and values, you don't, I do. Remember 28 years worth of experience behind me here. Um, I can then translate that into the sort of supplementary points that they're going to want to have you discuss in your answer. So let me give you an example. Um, uh, actually, let me give you an example from, I think this is probably one of the more challenging ones that confuses people the most. Um, the competency of we are innovative and open-minded. Uh, please, can you tell me about a time when you've used previous learning to influence or develop a new approach to a problem or a task. So please, can you tell me about a time when you've used previous learning to influence or develop a new approach to a problem or a task? This is about reflective learning. This is why it shouldn't be called innovative and open-minded. It should be about reflective learning. So they'll want to know um, supplementary points at the bottom. Um, what was the situation? What was the past learning or the previous experience? Why did you need to demonstrate something new? How did you demonstrate to others that you're open to change? How did you represent yourself as a role model? How did you share suggestions with others or encourage others to change or adapt? How did you reflect on your experience and ensure the new approach was working? And how did you resist the temptation to be influenced by the negativity of others? Now, most of those behaviours there are from the actual behaviours in the competency of uh, innovative and open-minded all i've done is translate them for you into something that's more meaningful and sounds more like more like english and so that's what your answer should include if you can't include all of those points it's not the end of the world trust me on this one um because i don't think the bar is particularly high i, I know i should be saying oh the bar is really high but i don't really think it is why do i say that well one of my clients delivered all the answers in the order of the competencies where I've got them, integrity, public service, transparency, we take ownership and we're innovative, open-minded. That's not the order that they're given in on your assessment. So what she actually did was she delivered answers to completely different questions, completely different questions because she had it all muddled up. She delivered them. So like for the integri her integrity answer, well, that's not the first question. The first question might have been we take ownership. So she delivered her integrity answer for we take ownership. And she did that all the way through the assessment center, all the way through the stage two interview. Uh, she still passed. She still passed despite the fact that her answers were completely not the answers to the questions being asked. So she still passed. So I, I'm, I'm not convinced that the bar is particularly high for this. Um, and I've heard some of the answers that people have given in the past that they say, well, I passed this before, I just failed the written and the briefing, that's why I'm here with you. And quite frankly, because um, I used to be an interviewer, they would not get through the final interview stage with, with, with that answer. So they pass the online assessment centre, but 
don't think that your online assessment center answer is going to be good enough for the interview. So at the interview, they're looking for something with more, more depth, more breadth, more challenge, more difficulty, more emotional connect. Whereas this is just a tick box process. You all with me so far? Give me a thumbs up or any sort of wobbly thumbs. All right, awesome stuff. So for those of you who are going to be here on Thursday, for those of you who are going to be in here on Thursday, um, <laughs> I'll be just saying in the chat, I found that today as well, but got them in an order in my head. Good, well done, LB. Well done. Um, and I, I've seen from your messages that you've been doing the assessment today. D just drop me a chat. How, how do you feel it's going so far? Um, so where am I up to? Yes, for those of you who are going to be here on Thursday, where we're going to practice, here's your challenge. Here's your homework between now and Thursday evening. Because on Thursday evening, it's going to be less me talking and more you talking. We're going to start with a, a quick round of introductions, and then we're going to go straight into practicing where I'm going to ask you to prepare between now and then one question the answer to one question from my question bank one question from my question bank prepare it using the structured process which I give you on the worksheets one where we talk about SAL situation aim action result and learning and all the different parts underneath it so for example for situation we describe our role and what we're doing, what the big challenge was, what the big difficulty was, what the big problem was. And then we also describe the impact on others, the impact on the organization, the impact on you, the impact on others. In the action phase, we don't just talk about what we did, we talk about how we did it. Because contrary to, contrary to, where is it, where's my constituent values framework? Oh, it's, on, it's in the bin. <laughs> Sorry, it's in the bin. Let's just get it out of the bin there. Um, contrary to what I know some of the books out there say, I know there's books out there that tell you how to become a police officer. I know it because I've seen the books. I've bought them. Of course, I'm going to look at those books. Of course, I'm going to watch their YouTube channel and all the different organizations that do something similar to me that have never been in the police before what they're doing <laughs> i think, think they know what they're doing advice advice to include phrases from the competency and values framework no just no it's not going to work i've just gone to we take ownership as an example actually let's pick one that you're actually going to oh we take ownership you're going to be asked a question about that so simply saying things like um so the actions i took well i actively identified and responded to the problem and I approached the task with enthusiasm. Um, in, in everything I did, I sought feedback from others to ensure that the quality of my work and the impact of my behavior was what was required. I gave feedback to others and I took responsibility for my own actions. Um, I made some mistakes and I admitted to them and took action to rectify them. In all of the thing I did, I demonstrated pride in representing my organization. And I also understood my strengths in all of this and my areas for development. I mean, it sounds good, doesn't it? But it's just a load of nonsense. It's just a load of nonsense. It's just, I'm not actually, I mean, you've not, you've not got a clue what I was doing from any of that. So please, this is why I say, put this away. You know, put it away. Because it's not going to do you any favours. And you are not going to pass by mentioning phrases from the competency and values framework. It doesn't work like that. Trust me, even though this is the most tick box process I've come across, it does not work like that. What they want to hear is how you did, let's love an example. So how did you um, approach the task with enthusiasm? How did you give feedback to others? How did you um take responsibility for your actions how did you work out what your areas for development were how did you get other people to support you and how did you support other people in return i want to know how you did it so that's what we're going to focus on on thursday evening there's three things that you're going to mess up on trust me on this i've been doing it for 28 years three things these are consistent things i'll put money on it that these things will happen on Thursday. The first one is some of you will not answer the question. 
So you'll deliver an answer and I'll get to the end of it and go, so where was the difficult decision? And you're going to go, I don't know. <laughs> um, someone's just sent me an example this afternoon and I've said the same thing. So where was the difficult decision? This is transparency, by the way. Uh, it wants to know more than just a difficult decision. So that's a common thing. You'll just fail to answer the actual question itself. The, the second thing that you'll do is you'll have a lack of structure. You might start off in a structured way, but then you'll meander off in all sorts of different directions. And you'll, by the end of your five minutes or three minutes or wherever you get up to, you will have probably started telling me about the experience that you've had, like you were telling a mate at the pub. That's not what they're after. They're after a structured approach. So keep to the structure I give you. It's been working for years, for decades. It will continue to work for decades. And the third thing is a lack of detail. Uh, you'll say things like, I spoke to the rest of the team. I held a meeting with the rest of my team. I discussed this with my manager. I, I approached the person calmly and professionally. I worked in a collaborative manner with the rest of the team to produce organizational um, uh, to, to, to produce and deliver on the organizational aims. Um, I sat with them and listened to them empathetically. No de that, there's no detail on any, any of that. I want to know how you did those things. So we'll focus on the how on Thursday as well. So that's three things, three big things we're going to focus on. One, answer the question. Make sure that your answer actually meets the needs of the question. Two, <coughs> excuse me, structure, structured approach. And three, detail, 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 detail. You'll hear me saying that over and over again on Thursday evening. I guarantee it that you need to include more detail. If you want 90% plus, you've got to do all of those three things. And that's it, full stop. That's it. Um, so pick, pick um, and what I'd recommend you do is pick, pick an answer that you're more comfortable with. So I'd much rather you um, work out what you're doing first, that you can start um, crawling before you can walk and walking before you can run. Let's do it that way for Thursday evening, as opposed to picking the, you know, picking a question from here that's the toughest one to answer. Let's not do that just yet. Uh, if it's Michaela and some of the others who have done this with me on previous webinars, yeah, I might be pushing you a little bit to pick one that's a bit harder. But for those of you who are new to the course, and remember, it's not just the webinars, it's the online course as well, which is on demand, and you can attend as many webinars as you want. So quite a few people have attended quite a few courses worth of uh, webinars. So, uh, but if it's the first time, pick one that's the easiest one for you. All right, I'll open it up to some questions now from the chat function, because um, there's quite a lot. I might not be able to answer all of them. Let me just see. Um, Iwalina, I've uh, covered that. BTP, contact me separately about BTP. British Transport Police, you can't transfer over the online assessment centre to British Transport Police. They're not a home office force. They do something completely different. Um, so another question about the day two for the Met. Uh, it will probably be role plays and six questions based on the competency and values framework. No, it won't be. Though, even though the invite says we're inviting you to an interview, it's not an interview, it's just two role plays. How do I start with a role play? I'm not good at it. Uh, that's a completely different webinar. Follow my Kudsa model. Follow my script, you'll nail it. Um, let's just see. If you fail a national SIFT, how long do you have to wait before you can reapply? I do believe that's three months. Um, are you allowed to base some of the answers based on being a special constable? Yes, you can, but be wary of that because what special constables and PCSOs and people in the military and people who've done awesome, awesome things where I doff my cap to you, what you tend to do is deliver an answer, which is your latest, greatest arrest or some house search that you did or some road traffic collision that you went to or someone who's been wanted for five years who you caught or you stopped this car and it was full of drugs. Where you got back to the station and there was a commendation waiting for you there's pats on the back, tea and medals all around. Yeah, the, well, the problem with those, though, is that they don't actually demonstrate the behaviours. So anything in quick time that's taking you like 
10 minutes to deal with probably isn't going to cut it because it doesn't give you the opportunity to demonstrate all the behaviors so yes you can but i mean try it out on thursday evening um, that's probably the best best way of doing things just try it out on thursday evening um, because there's only one place to make mistakes and that's here with me not on the day of your assessment um we've got um someone there Al, um i'll be saying everything that i who's already done what are you doing here Albie? you've done your assessment center you've done it he's here for reassurance is my guess uh, everything you said ex is exactly what happened i'm now waiting for the results you've passed Albie. uh matt is saying snap definitely enjoying the webinar though great stuff all right well if you're enjoying it hang around um pcso to pc through the met can your line manager recommend you for a constable role well, we can recommend you or you could just apply um the webinars plus package group with every introduction video and recorded video will be put on the group yes it will be Air all the recordings there's over a year's worth of recordings in the group but i would just focus on um really courses four and three from this year can you apply for pcso and police officer at the same time yes you can and hi brendan i've applied oh wait a minute just jumped Hi, Brendan, I've applied for PCSO and DHEP with Merseyside Police. Um, I was asked to interview for PCSO a few days after my application was successful. Will this help me with when the uptake ends? Will it help you get a job? So I, I've got no problem, and forces won't have a problem with you keeping a PCSO and PC application running at the same time. Um, David saying, what's your potential, uh, what's your opinion on potentially take, taking up a university offer of doing policing over waiting in a talent pool to do the PCSA? Uh, wait in the talent pool um, because the PCDA will still be around. I think the degree holder entry program is going to go down the toilet and actually a few forces are binning it already. So I think a lot of forces will move towards the initial le police learning and development program, which doesn't involve a degree. Uh, the PCDA though, uh, excuse me, The PCDA that was popular with the police because they've been top sliced for the apprenticeship levy, which means like it or not, they've had millions taken off them across the country uh, for the uh, apprenticeship levy. So they're getting the money's worth now by sending people on apprenticeship courses at universities. They don't have to pay for it. It's funded by the government because all big organizations get an apprenticeship top slice levy, including the police. So what I would do is I would um, wait out to, if you've passed everything and you're in the talent pool, well, make sure you've got a high mark to start with, then you're gonna get taken out of it sooner rather than later and do the PCDA. Why? Because if you leave university with a policing degree, there's no guarantee that you're actually going to get into the police. And a lot of forces don't actually have the policing degree route available. And if they do, they don't open it up that much. And you'll have £50,000 plus of debt round your neck uh, with no guarantee of a job at the end of it. So PCDA every day of the week. It's a degree that's been funded by the police. You're in your dream job. You're earning money. What's not to like about that? I know it's hard work to balance it all out, but what is not to like about that? Even if, I mean, a lot of universities deliver a terrible product according to the College of Policing's own data. That's just not me saying that. The College of Policing, their data shows massive dissatisfaction rates with the PCDA um, and how it's delivered. You know, but still, it's a great it's a great thing. You're going to get a degree at the end of it. All right. Uh, DHEP is funded by the police. Yes, it is. Um, the value of transparency, what's that about? <laughs> Come and find out on Thursday evening. Uh, we'll actually practice that value. Um, we'll practice the question. It's in here. The question's in there. All right, let's move on, because I said it'd be about an hour, and we've been over an hour. Um, someone's just said, why would I have debt around uh, your neck? Well, if you do a policing degree outside of the police, you've got to pay for it. I don't think there's a free degree from any university. Is there? Does anyone know of one? You've actually got to pay for it. And at the end of it, there's no guarantee that you're actually going to be in the police. If you get into the police and do the degree holder entry program diploma or the police constable degree apprenticeship, as long as you get your degree or diploma at the end of it, then you've got a job and you've got a job right from the start, right from day one. 
and the degree is paid for. The degree is paid for. So it's pretty awesome, actually. I think it's pretty good. But if you do a policing degree out of your own pocket, there are no guarantees. All right, let's move on. Let's move on. <laughs> so it says, David said it's not David, actually, it's Archie. Couldn't get on the webinar on my own device. All right, Archie, David. You know who I mean, don't you? Um, okay, let's uh, move on. Um, any questions, any other questions? Uh, a big, big questions about the stage two interview. No, all right, awesome stuff. Stage three. Oh, you're going to love the stage three. Oh, and I know there's one question that I always get asked that no one actually asked. Um, can I use notes that I've made before for the exercises in the assessment centre? Well, the College of Policing guidance says that you should not use notes that you've made before in any assessment which is part of the assessment centre. But you can make notes in the one minute preparation phase. And then the written exercise, which I'll talk about in a moment, that's two hours long. There's no camera on you. Um, so, but you can make notes in that one minute preparation phase. Now, most people make notes on pieces of paper that look like this. Would you agree with me? Blank piece of paper. I, however, I'm a weirdo. I believe in making sure that we reuse, reuse paper. So I tend to make notes in pencil like that so that then I can reuse my notes and write over them in black ink. So I can get like two sets of notes out of one piece of paper. Two papers worth of notes on one piece of paper. How awesome is that? I mean, how many trees am I saving by doing that? What's in the background is irrelevant because it's in pencil. Look, it's all in pencil. So can you use notes that you've made before? Well, the College of Policing Guidance says that you should not use notes that you've made before. But you've got one minute to make notes prior to delivering your answer. What you choose to make your notes on is up to you. That's all I'll say. Because here's my notes. Here's my notepad. Can anyone read what's on there? And it could, would anyone like to just stand up and look down? It doesn't work like that, does it? <laughs> no one fell for it. Sometimes people fall for that one. I'll get people going like this. It doesn't work like that. It's not Star Trek. It's not Mission Impossible. They can only see what's in that screen. So whatever notes you scribble on, you can actually read off. And what you choose to make your notes on is up to you. I'll just park that there for you. Um, right, let's move on. Stage three written. You're going to love the stage three written. The reason why you're going to love it is because the College of Policing, in their guidance, say that you really do not need to have any knowledge of policing whatsoever to do the assessment centre. Now, who's done the assessment centre before and failed it? Because that's why you're here. Um, Serin, if I can ask you a question, Serin. <laughs> Sorry, you, you put your hand up first. So, Serin, um, you've done the written exercise before. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's nothing to do with policing, is it? No. <laughs> <laughs> now, Seren can't actually disclose what the written exercise is all about, but my no. guess, my guess is it starts with you are a police constable in, so it puts you in a position of being a police officer. Yes. Yeah. And then it's going to ask you about all sorts of different problem solving, community engagement. Uh, vulnerability issues, yeah. And what would I do about it? Yeah. And what you're going to do about it? What's your understanding of the situation? Yeah. The impact. How, how the, am I going to resolve it all? How are you going to resolve it all? Yeah. How are you going to deal, engage with the community and partners? What solutions are you going to deliver? Of course, you don't need any knowledge of policing, do you? <laughs> Nothing. No. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd done all right in it, actually. Yeah. Oh, well, you will next time. I guarantee I it. I will. Um, what I found was I froze when I was doing the interview. I Just the nerves kicked in. That's that's what done it. Right. Well, the way I around was looking all goggly gook <laughs> by the end of that. The way, yeah. to, the way to ensure you ace it is to practice. Prepare, practice, prepare, practice, prepare, practice. Uh, yes. thanks, Karin. Thank you. Thank you for uh, being us there. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, 
Actually, how many of you are actually practicing in front of a camera, recording yourself for five minutes for the interview? Yeah, um, <laughs> my clients. <laughs> awesome, well done. You're doing exactly what I've asked you to do. Brilliant. Um, okay, so that's what you need to be doing. That will get rid of that freeze moment, that, ah, that I'm really nervous moment. Um, confidence doesn't come from people saying, oh, you'll be fine. Oh, you'll be great. You're a natural at this. Confidence does not come from that. Confidence comes from preparation and practice. You, you're, those of you who are my clients know that I never wish you luck because if you feel you need luck, you've not done enough preparation and practice. There is no substitute for it. And th those of you who are my clients will be sick of me saying, taking action on a daily basis, doing something that's not just reading something on a daily basis, actually practicing on a daily basis. This is what will get you that pass. And this is what will take away those nerves and give you, put you in a position, Sarah, when you're far more relaxed. Doing this for years, it works. All right, so yeah, I was a bit tongue in cheek there and uh, Sarah sort of played along with my tongue in cheek about you're not needing any knowledge of policing. The written exercise, <clears throat> I've not got a copy with me, um, but it's on the online course under the worksheets part. Um, and the, the version I've got, I believe, is very, very similar. Um, they're putting you in a position where you're a new constable in an area that has a block of flats. Um, I do believe it's called Rennington Towers. In my exercise, it's uh, Oxford Towers. And in that block of flats, there's a lot of residents. Uh, some of them have English as a second language. Some of them are vulnerable individuals. One of the vulnerable individuals has been victim of a hate crime where he has had a rock thrown through his window um, into the living room where he was sat inside the living room at the same time and he's had graffiti daubed on the side of his flat. He's a vulnerable male with a disability. Um, I can't remember his name now. Emmanuel, I think his name is. In my version, it's Romeo. I picked Romeo. I don't know why I picked Romeo. It's just the first name that came into my head. You have very little information about it and you have to talk about your concerns and what your inve investigative plan is going to be to deal with it. You don't have to have any knowledge of policing. Look, I, I was a neighbourhood inspector for eight years. That's a hate crime. That is a, that's two hate crimes. Potentially that could have been a murder investigation. A rock has been thrown through someone's window into their living room whilst they were sat in their living room. That potentially could have been a murder investigation or certainly would have ended up as a manslaughter charge if Emmanuel had died from it. You don't need to have any knowledge of policing. I would not send round a student officer to deal with that. I would want one of my sergeants to send round a very experienced constable to deal with that. And I'd want the sergeant to be all over it like a rash in terms of supervising the investigation. It's a very, very potentially um, serious crime that's taken place. And so this is why I find it wholly ridiculous of the College of Policing to say you don't need to have any knowledge of policing. It's a hate crime. It's a really serious hate crime that's taken place. And you're going to have to talk about what your investigative plan's going to be and what the impact's going to be, how you're going to work with partners to address this. It's really complex policing. I'm not just saying that to BS you or anything. I was a neighbourhood inspector for eight years. Um, and before that, as a response inspector for three or four years. This would be way up there on my, right, we need to be paying close attention to this because the next rock that goes through the window could be a murder investigation. Um, in terms of threat, harm and risk, it's way up there. Anyway, so let's put that to one side. You know, in this tower block, you've also got all sorts of evidence from newspaper reports, local councillors, that there's absolutely zero trust in the police, that the place is run down, falling apart, nothing's working, all the locks are damaged, the CC, none of the CCTV's working, young people are running riot in the area, committing acts of criminal damage and antisocial behaviour. Quite frankly, if I was a neighbouring inspector in, in, responsible for this area, this geographical area, I would have got my coat months before because quite frankly it's an indication that i'm a terrible awful police officer to have let an area get so bad so you don't need to have any knowledge of policing 
you've got a really challenging task here in terms of problem solving and community engagement. I've, I've never taken over an area, so no, actually, I've one, one area within Stockport East when I had two neighbourhoods, my second neighbourhood, Stockport East, I did have an area which seems very similar to this one. And my question of the sergeants was, what the hell have you been doing over the past few years to let it get so bad? And my question of the head of community safety at Stockport was the same. Why is this so bad? How did we let this get so bad? Because this is inexcusable. It's inexcusable for an area to get so bad in terms of quality of life. So uh, perhaps I'm overcomplicating things a little bit, but my clients get over 90%, so they're not bothered whether I overcomplicate things or not. They just follow up the guidance of what we're going to do next Tuesday, which is to actually work through the case study, which I provide you. And this will give you pretty much a template that you can use. It might seem a bit overcomplicated at times, uh, but I can't help that because there's only one way of dealing with things, and that's the right way. We don't take half measures when we're investigating serious crime, and we don't take half measures when we're trying to do all we can to enable that community to be a more cohesive place again. And so what we describe is a method of problem solving, uh, which is way beyond the traditional SARA model, which is scanning analysis, response and assessment. We use a, a sort of based on an eight step asset based approach to problem solving, which gets the community involved as well uh, at a very deep level. And so we talk about this process that we can follow and all you're going to do is write about that process and it's going to give you 90% plus. And you're going to find it useful. I know this when you're actually in the police because I get feedback from so many people to say, actually, I'm using these skills now on my neighborhood team in, in the problem solving that we're doing. Um, and it's not just based on Brennan's wild ideas. Um, it's based on research. It's based on me doing work with the European Union once I retired from the police, um, where my role was to help um, a big project introduce improved problem solving and community engagement, mostly in Central and Eastern Europe. I've spoken at conferences about this. Um, I worked in the Strategic Change Branch from my last year, where my responsibility was community engagement and problem solving. And I've everything that we talk about on Monday has research that underpins it. So not just Brendan's wild ideas, um, although for those of you who are specials and PCSOs, you may think, wow, this is a bit radical. This is a bit something our force would like to do, uh, but it will get you over 90%. That's the important thing. It'll get you over 90%. So you've got two hours to do that written exercise in. There's no camera on you. You should not use notes that you've used before, but I mean, my office looks quite tidy from here, doesn't it? But if I showed you my desk, it looks like a paper explosion. Honestly, I'm the most disorganized, chaotic person you could ever hope to meet. Um, I am not tidy at all. So I've always got paper lying around all over the place. So you might just happen to have some notes lying around. Who knew? Hey, oh God, did I just have these lying around? Ugh. Um, on your desk that no one can see. And actually no one can see it. Michaela, I promise you, there's no camera on you. There's no camera on you. So I'd expect by the end of next Tuesday that you will have a load of detail in your head, in your head, in your notes in your head, that you can just transpose onto the screen in the two hours that you've got to complete the written exercise. Does that make sense, folks? That makes sense? Give me a thumbs up or give me a wobbly thumb. Right, awesome stuff. So let like Megan back in the room, she keeps dropping out. All right, any questions about the written then? Any questions at all about the written exercise? No, you're all very quiet tonight. Um, anything, folks? No? All righty. He said with an American accent, almost. All righty, I don't know where that came from. Anyway, um, sorry, let's just make like Matt back in the room. Some of you keep dropping in and dropping out. I'll just see if there's any other questions that uh, I can answer from the chat function. Um, uh, Megan, do you, uh, do you need a different answer for every question? I'm struggling to come up with a different scenario for every question. I'm sure it'll come. Yes, you do. Yeah, you do need a different answer. You can't use the same scenario over and over again. Uh, despite the fact that it's very tick box, the assessor is probably assessing about 10 of you every day for the interview part. 
if you think about it, 30 minutes, 10 of you, that's about five hours worth with about 10 or 15 minutes of um, form filling either side. So they're probably doing about 10 of you every day. Um, they're bored out of their brains uh, because they've been hearing the same stuff coming from you for two years now. Um, people are either freezing, going, Ugh, or delivering an answer that's all over the place. They're probably not even watching you. They're just listening for you to say key things so they can just go tick, tick, tick against the marking guide, which is there. That's the marking guide. So if you use the same scenario, they're not going to mark it because it, it needs a different scenario each time. Um, you won't struggle, Megan. I'm fairly sure, Megan, that you're actually coming to join us on Thursday. Um, I'm fairly sure you're on the programme. Uh, you're on that package. Come and join us on Thursday. Trust me, in your life, you'll have done sufficient things to have uh, five different answers. It's what I do on the Thursday evening. We start working out. I'll ask you questions about, so have you ever had the opportunity to do X? And I've had things like, well, I've not really got any experience of um, taking ownership for something. And then I'll find that that person did Duke of Edinburgh. Anyone who's done Duke of Edinburgh can walk every one of the answers because Duke of Edinburgh provides you with loads. Or have you ever had a part-time job? Yeah, but it was really boring. And then five minutes later, we've got an awesome answer that comes from that part-time job. It's what I do. So Megan, don't worry, you'll be fine. We will <coughs> sort out that out on Thursday evening. Um, Iwalina is asking, can I have the link please for Thursday? Uh, if you're part of, the course, you'll get it automatically in the Facebook group that you're part of. If you're not, and you want to join us, at the very top of the chat, um, I put the link to the Online Assessment Centre plus webinars course, uh, where you can enrol through that link. Or just send me a message after. Uh, Megan's saying I'll be there, awesome. All right, let's move on to the last part. This is the part you're really gonna love. College of Policing, what on earth was going through your head when you came up with this nonsense? The briefing, the stage three briefing. This is where you're going to talk for potentially up to 36 minutes. It's not a briefing, by the way. They've called the stage two interview an interview. It's not an interview. A briefing is where you provide a briefing to people. The, the police officers I work with for promotion boards for sergeant, inspector, superintendent, they have to do 10 minute, 15 minute briefings as part of their board. It's all at once, 10 or 15 minutes all at once. You're not going to do that, but you've still got to deliver 36 minutes worth. It's just that it'll be in answer to 12 questions. So they're going to give you a scenario. And then they're going to ask you a total of 12 questions about that scenario. You've got one minute to think about each answer and then three minutes to deliver your answer. One minute to think about it, three minutes to deliver it. And then it cuts you off at three minutes and rolls straight on to the next question. You don't get given all the questions at the same time. It's not like my sample, exit, my sample the one that we're going to use next Thursday, a week on Thursday where we're going to practice this. You're going to practice this and you're going to realize actually three minutes is a long time to speak. I guarantee this. You're going to think that is a long time to speak. I can pack a lot into three minutes. So the, the scenario they're going to give you, quite frankly, is ridiculous. Uh, the first scenario that they gave you up to about a year ago was one that was completely ridiculous. They gave you a scenario of a community that's been infiltrated by drug dealers from an organized crime syndicate and a lot of the people who are being harmed by uh, the use of drugs are people who are homeless uh, but the community is up in arms about the homeless community um, and it's completely ridiculous you don't need to have any knowledge of policing it took me about two years as neighborhood inspectors to start working out effective techniques to tangle org organized crime gangs when I became an, an inspector 20 years ago, was it 20 years ago now? It was 21 years ago I became an inspector. Oh, my goodness. And I became a neighbourhood inspector shortly after that. There was no rule book on how to tackle or guidebook on how to tackle organised crime gangs. 
They weren't even called organised crime gangs back then. Before our sisters, bless their souls, Fiona and Nicola were murdered. Quite frankly, GMP didn't care about organised crime. They just let it, it just happened in the background. Um, I did, as a neighbourhood inspector, I was one of those weird inspectors that I used to get scratchy head moments from superintendents, but the chief constable loved what I was doing. Um, even wrote a paper on it. Um, if you ask me, I'll send it to you. It's called Responsible Citizenship. Um, it was authored by Sir Peter Fahey for the Reform Think Tank. Um, anyway, I'm going off at a tangent, but he based that on a lot of the work I was doing, actually on all the work I was doing, my team was doing, to tackle organised crime and enable strong, cohesive community to fill the vacuum that's left behind. So anyway, that was the first version of the Stage 3 briefing, which was absolutely bonkers. Like I said, it took me two years to perfect techniques to tackle organised crime gangs and to develop and enable and build strong, cohesive community in its place. And they're asking you to talk about it for 36 minutes in the briefing. So they had feedback about that, that quite frankly, what you're asking them to do is ridiculous. I know that because I know with people in the police who fed, kept feeding it back to the College of Policing to say, this is insane. And so the College of Policing went the other way. And they came up with uh, three sample exercises that you could have got. Uh, one of them was you're at a rave and you're a police officer at an illegal rave where there's about a thousand people. And it starts going a bit pear-shaped and questions about what you're going to do to deal with it. Now, the feedback College of Policing got was you'd have a gold command system in place for something like that with a superintendent at the very least making the gold decisions. And you don't use phrases like riot vans because that was in the exercise as well. How do I know? Because I've seen it. <laughs> I've seen the draft versions. Um, riot van. The police don't use that phrase. The police don't. When, do you, when did you ever hear a police officer say riot van? Quite frankly, um, whoever designed that needs, needed their backside kicking. So the feedback was get rid of that because that's rubbish. The next one that you could have got was um, that you're a police officer in a community. You've just been placed there. You're the new neighbourhood officer. Um, but crime has got so out of control that vigilante groups are now starting to take action against criminals. And vigilante action is being taken on a regular basis. Oh, and, and, and it's predominantly black as well. So there's no stereotypes going on there, is there? And actually, I do not know anywhere in the country where there's vigilante action taking place. And quite frankly, any inspector who's in charge of an area where there's now vigilante action being taken place um, deserve, deserves the sack for misconduct. So they got similar feedback to say that this is something that you'd have a superintendent overseeing, not some constable who's hoping to join the police. So they went the other way and they came up with um, a noisy party. You're a constable out on patrol with a fellow officer. It's 2100 hours on a Friday evening. You're in a busy, you're in a residential area and you see what looks like a party taking place in a house. There's several young people in the front living room they appear to be drinking alcohol. There's a lot of noise coming from there. The music's really loud. Now, does anyone know what forced policy is in respect of noisy parties? Anyone know what the forced policy is in respect of noisy parties? Um, Dave Archie's, is it a daughter there saying, is it? I'm guessing there's a little one saying, I know, I know. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> We've got a guest. I've got to watch my language now. I'm saying, got to watch my language. Um, <laughs> it's just wave your hands in the air. Way, no, mum, come on, <laughs> come on, take it away. <laughs> awesome stuff. Um, <laughs> so, sorry, that just tickled me. The things that happen on webinars. Awesome stuff. Um, where was I? Yeah, uh, I wouldn't expect you to know, but if you if you look on actually if you if you just Google noisy party police, and uh, it'll probably bring up force areas like the Met Police. They're frequently asked questions, and what it says is we don't deal with noisy parties. There's not a force in this country that deals with noisy parties. Not one. Um, is anyone working in a force control room? Anyone? No. Oh, sometimes uh, we have people on the force control room. This is how it works. Um, if you phone the police to report a noisy party. Hello, is that the police? Yes, please, sir. What's your emergency? Yeah, I'd like to report a noisy party, please. That's happening in my house. 
and there's young people in there, and I'm sure they've got some alcohol. Yeah, and what else? Well, nothing else, that's it. There's a noisy party, and I'm sure some of them got alcohol. <clears throat> yeah, we're the police, we don't deal with noisy parties. Can you call environmental services on Monday morning? Bye-bye. Phone goes down. That's how to get dealt with by the police. If I was walking past a house and I saw young people, it doesn't even say what age young people are, but let's just say they're 16. They're celebrating the end of their GCSEs. And I saw, and I heard loud music coming from the house and I saw young people, a couple of cans of Strongbow. What do you think my actions would be? I'll tell you what my actions would be. I keep on walking. As a police officer with 28 years experience and another nine years of experience of working in the sector after that, I just keep on walking. Why? Because you've got no powers to deal with the noisy party. There's no offences being committed. If you Google it, you'll find that as long as you're not seven years old, you can lawfully drink alcohol in your own house from eight onwards. If you're 16 years old, you can drink alcohol in a pub. If you're having a meal, which a, a stated case tells us that a cheese and beetroot sandwich with onions and crisps on the side is not a substantial meal. That's a stated case from the 1960s. I don't know why that stuck in my head. Um, but if you're having a substantial meal in a pub, you can drink cider, wine, beer, or porter. I have no idea what porter is, by the way, but it's just in the legislation. So you can drink porter if you want, and it is alcohol, at 16 in a pub. So what they've given you here is a completely ludicrous, ridiculous situation where they're going to ask you to talk for 36 minutes about something that you will never deal with in the police. You will never be dispatched to a noisy party unless there are aggravated circumstances like someone's just had the lights punched out or they've been thrown out of an upstairs window or someone's just fired a gun in uh, at the window of the noisy party or someone's been raped or someone's been assaulted or something really nasty has happened. A noisy party on its own with young people in it, you will not be dispatched to it. Promise you that. So they've given you a policing scenario which doesn't exist in this country at all. I believe in Scotland there's some powers to deal with noisy parties, but we're not in Scotland. And the National Assessment Centre happens in England and Wales. So I've got to bite my lip here, because when we work through this exercise, I'm going to ask you the questions. Like the first question will be, what is the main priority you'd want to address first? Why is this a priority for you? What are your ideas to address this? So you've got three minutes to answer that. The second question will be, what are the other potential issues with this party? Why could they be an issue? What could the consequences be of alcohol at the party? What are the potential issues with the noise? And it all ramps up. After four questions, they're going to ramp up the scenario, the development of the scenario. Another four questions later, they're going to ramp it up again, the further development of the scenario. It's a noisy party where nothing really happens. You've got to talk for 36 minutes about nothing, which is bonkers. Except that the way we're going to deal with it is we're going to have to take ourselves out of the real world, folks. To deal with this in a way that, oh, I still grip my teeth and think, am I really giving them advice to do this? We have to remember that we're going to have to put ourselves in College of Policing La La Land. Now, do you remember what I said about people at the College of Policing? I've worked with them and for them on four occasions. They're very nice people. But in many of the conversations I'd have with them, and actually most of them have never been police officers before. Some of them actually, I used to wonder actually, do you, do you even, remember the conversation with one of them, there was some work I did in a force in Wales with them. I remember saying to them, do you, do you actually like the police? Because you're coming across as someone who doesn't like the police. And she said, well, I've not really got much time for them. I said, you're working for the College of Policing. <laughs> How does that work? I said, well, you know, it's a job. All right. Um, most of them have never had a warrant card in their pocket. Nice people, no idea, not got a clue. If they just contacted police forces to say, is this a realistic scenario? Just about every police force would say no. And every police force probably has said no, but the College of Policing, being what it is, has gone ahead and delivered it. And this is what you're being assessed against. Everything the College of Policing does is doomed to success right from the very start. So nice people, zero common sense. They've developed something which is just insane because you will never deal with a noisy party unless there's aggravating factors. And there's no aggravating factors in this one. Friday evening, foot patrol with a colleague 
I mean, that's not going to happen anyway. <laughs> that's never going to happen. You're going to be out dealing with robberies, high risk missing from homes, someone's mother's threatening to jump off a bridge, there's a sudden death, someone's, someone's got a, a fractured skull, um, someone, uh, I don't know, someone, uh, someone, uh, uh, all of that kind of stuff, an armed robbery. You know, this is, this is your bread and butter, not a noisy party. So we're going to have to put ourselves in the College of Policing in La La world, which, La La Land, where in College of Policing world, noisy parties are a serious priority for the Chief Constable. And with, you're just going to have to bite your lip and you're going to have to listen to me when I give, a, give, give you advice on how you're going to deal with each scenario as it develops. I'll be like, oh, am I really saying this? Because it's, we've got to put ourselves in College of Policing world. We've got to put ourselves in their heads to deal with this realistically, um, because otherwise it's just going to drive you mad thinking about why why am I why am I saying this is how I deal with it because I wouldn't because you're not going to score well by just delivering the answer which is I'd see the party and I'd think they're having fun and continue walking. There's no answer. There's no marks for that. There's no marks for it. So we're going to have to come up with all sorts of ludicrous stuff. However, it's not ludicrous stuff. It's, it's models of policing and systems of policing, which I've been using for years in terms of how do you negotiate a compromise position? What your policing style is going to be? How do you assess threat, harm and risk? What sort of steps can you take to ensure the welfare of young people? Um, how are you going to deal with angry neighbours? How are you going to deal with non-communicative people, especially young people? How are you going to manage uh, social media issues? Uh, and a whole range of other stuff that's, that tips out of this. And we're going to use techniques and systems that work every time. They've worked for me for decades in the police. They'll work for this exercise as well. And so a lot of what we do is based on um, police techniques that you'd use anyway. This is one thing I learned as a police officer 38 years ago. God, that makes me sound really old, doesn't it? 38 years ago. It was, it was 38 years ago. Jeez, in 1985. Um, I'm quite disorganised and chaotic. Um, but one thing that really helped me all the way through my service was having a system, um, a system and a process for dealing with most incidents. So even if I had several different types of incidents to deal with all wrapped up in one, I'd have several different systems and processes that I could use to implement in a consistent way that would enable me to manage those situations really, really well. That'll make more sense to you when we actually do the exercise on Thursday evening. This is, I, th I think, one of the most daunting parts of the assessment process. And you'll see a lot of people and hear a lot of people in a Facebook group saying things like, I found this really difficult because I was repeating myself over and over again. The questions do kind of repeat themselves, but they are repeating themselves based on a different scenario, how the scenario is developing. So I'll give you an example of that from my worksheet. Um, in part two, as the scenario develops, it asks if the information has changed your approach and what your priority is now and what your thoughts regarding this. It's the same questions, but you've just got to identify how your answer needs to be different because of the ever-changing circumstances that you're dealing with. Does, does that make sense? Does that make sense? It seems to have not. It'll make more sense when we put it into practice. Knowledge and understanding is one thing. When we practice, we practice to develop that knowledge and understanding into the skills that are needed that are going to get you a pass. So that's the briefing exercise. Any questions about the briefing? No? All right. Awesome stuff. Um, any questions at all about the online assessment centre then? Anything I'm not covered? Or you're all sat there like frightened rabbits thinking, oh my goodness. <laughs> um, <laughs> any question? No. Well, listen, listen. It's, I'm not going to say it's easy to pass. I do get people sometimes saying, how easy is it to pass the online assessment centre? Anything is easy to do if you're proficient in it. 
So the way we get proficient in it is we develop our knowledge and understanding of what's needed to pass it and then translate that into the skills, the skills. So, uh, oh, here's a couple of questions. Uh, actually, Elliot's saying civil matter, no powers apart from annoying the neighbours. No offence is being made. Yeah, there's no, there's no offence of annoying neighbours. We've got annoying neighbours. You want one side, they're awesome. The other side, they are so annoying. Honestly, I just don't even speak to them. Talk about a lack of community cohesion. Um, but they annoy me. That's not an offence. The police are never going to deal with that. Uh, Theresa saying, name some of the models and systems that you've mentioned. So we've got things like CUTSA, which is non-conflict contact management, sorry, a non-conflict, sorry, late in the day, CUTSA, a non-contact conflict management model. Uh, and that stands for confront, and that's not as in confront. There's certain things that we're going to say to maybe one of the neighbours, and then we're going to seek a deeper understanding through the next phase, and we're going to do that by asking really specific questions of the neighbour. Um, and a lot of the questions will be to develop their empathy. And then we're going to move into the define and summarise phase, which is where we actually repeat back to the neighbour to ensure that we've got all the information that we need. And then we're going to look to seek solutions. And we're going to see what solutions the neighbour would propose. And then from that, we're going to look how we're going to assess and monitor this situation with the angry neighbour until we get to the point which has got the desired result, which is looking at how we can find some kind of negotiated compromise situation. And there's things we can do after that to follow it up that also involve a systematic approach. Um, other things are like the five stage appeals process, the four E's, uh, threat, risk and harm, uh, the Thrive model, um, what else? The national decision model comes into it. Uh, we also look at um, partnership working, um, the other agencies that you might want to work with and how, and how you do follow up in terms of setting up a working group and what that working group would involve. And that was, that's a systematic approach as well, because um, that answers the very last question, which is around what could the long-term impact be? Uh, how would you reduce the impact of it? And how would you, what would you do to work alongside um, others and who would those people be to reduce the risks of further noisy parties. So hopefully, Teresa, that gives you a bit of an idea. That's just a flavour of them. There's an absolute ton of them. What else is there? Um, one of the things I talk about a lot is communication as well. There's a little model I used when I was a police officer. You won't find this by Googling it. It's called TPAC. So whenever we do anything that has any element of enforcement in it or it could result in enforcement, we also take measures to develop and build trust to prevent things happening in the first place. What can we do to be advocates for the community and what uh, communication, what our style of communication is going to be? Um, yeah, a lot of safeguarding stuff as well. There'll be a lot of safeguarding information that you can include for the stage three briefing. And of course, you don't need to have any knowledge of policing, but this is what's going to get you 90%. Teresa, I hope that answers the question for you. Um, right, there's nothing else. <laughs> Good, yeah, I got the thumbs up there. Brilliant. Uh, there's nothing else. Um, so what I do, Teresa, is it, you can find out all of that stuff yourself, but you don't know what you don't know. Um, so what I do is I help bring it all together. And if you use all of those different models, um, trust me, you will nail the different behaviours in the competency and values framework. I've kind of mapped all, mapped all of those things out. So if you're looking at um, dealing with the angry neighbour, um, if the competency you're being assessed against was emotionally aware, you'd be treating them with respect, tolerance and compassion. You'd be acknowledging a range of different perspectives. Uh, you'd be remaining calm and thinking about how to best manage the situation. You'd be uh, looking for help and support when you need it, because we talk about how you do that as well. Uh, communicating in a clear and simple language. So actually, you're, you're demonstrating all of those behaviours by talking about how you'd apply that model. And that's why I say you don't need a competency and values framework. You just need to, to know how to apply things in a systematic way. I know I'm bombarding you with a lot of stuff here, but when we do the webinars, it all makes sense, promise you. I absolutely promise you that. And you've also, to warm yourself up, you've got previous webinars you can watch to start developing your scripts. Um, Oh, thank you, Teresa. She's also saying your book's been very useful. It's out of date, though. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, oh, as an educator, I value the approach. Oh, well, we could we have an interesting discussion, Teresa. Um, it's very experiential. I like to base my approach on one that's very, very experiential. Um, I'm a big believer in experiential learning. If you're a fellow ed uh, educator, uh, consider myself an educator in adult education, Teresa, but also um, I'm, I'm a very strong, firm believer in the power of education for children. So um, we, we took our kids out of the state system and sent them to a Waldorf Steiner school. Is that is that something you're familiar with, Waldorf Steiner? You know, the principles behind, oh yes, you know, principles behind Waldorf Steiner education are very much based on experience, collaborative learning, um, experiential learning, um, and then trying to understand that experience. And so that's what I base a lot of what I do on, um, which is which are principles that I think schools have forgotten now. Anyway, I'm going way off on the tangent, aren't I? Bring myself back. Some of you are thinking, get on, it. Well, get on with it, Brendan. I've got my tea to get tea together. Um, okay, so Meg is saying I've been reading the book. It's it's um, uh, the book's out of date. Sorry, <laughs> can I just share with you. I need to I need to get a new version. It's out of date already. The webinars aren't. That's why I've said look at course number three and course number four. They're in date. They're absolutely up to date. The stage three written in the book is completely out of date. The stage three briefing is out of date. The stage two guidance is up to date, um, but I've now got more specific questions. So in some respects, it's out of date. So I need a new version of that book. That's a problem with the book. You publish it, and as soon as you publish it, it's out of date. Uh, the good thing about webinars is they don't go out of date because you just look at the last one. It's always the most up to date. All right, folks, we're going to wrap up in a moment. I know some of you are not part of the webinars program. Um, I'd love you to come and join me and come and join everyone else. Um, because this is how, as a team, as a community, we get to that point where in six months time, four months time, you're sending me an email or a message to say, here I am at my passing out parade. Who wants that? I mean, who's up for that? Who's up for that? Have you already got that as a vision in your head? You need to have this as a concrete vision of your future to get that warrant card in your pocket, to pass everything first time, because that's the other thing we do. We don't focus on, oh, if I fail it this time, I'll pass it next time. That's not our world. We don't do, I hope I'll pass, or with some luck. We don't do luck. If we're relying on luck, we've not prepared and practiced enough. So I'd love for you to come and join me. And here's the thing. I'm so convinced that what I do works, that if you fail, I'll give you money back. And that's not bad, is it? Try getting that from a university. Uh, I didn't get, I didn't get, a, uh, I was after a 2-1 and I, I didn't get a 2-1. Can I have my money back, please? That's not going to work, is it? Um, it works for me, though, because I'm all in on this journey. So much so that if you fail, it means I've not served you well. I've not served you well enough. And it means that you might not be a good fit for the police anyway, in which case I want us to part as friends. So if you fail, I'll give you your money back. If you join the programme, and if within 24 hours you're thinking, this is dreadful, this isn't for me, then let me know and I'll give you money back. Um, I want you to succeed, and I'm prepared to invest that time and effort in helping you to succeed. So... Please, I'd love for those of you who, I know there's many of you who are in this group tonight who are going to make it for Thursday evening because you're already enrolled. I look forward to seeing some of you again and I look forward to seeing and meeting some of you for the first time. Uh, for those of you who haven't enrolled, just drop me a line in the top of the chat function. There's a link to the website. Um, go to the interview course plus webinars option. And that's where you sign up. And like I said, feel free to watch the webinars, look at the worksheets, print them off if you want. And if within 24 hours you think it's not for me, then just let me know. I won't ask any questions. I'll just give you a refund because I know you won't. I know you won't. No one's ever asked for a refund within 24 hours. No one, not one person ever. I have given refunds to people who have failed. Over the past year, I've given two refunds, two, two refunds. These are two individuals who worked hard, they did everything, and they didn't pass. Um, one of them came back and paid for it again, and they did pass. And the other one, we just parted as friends. They just said, it's not for me. 
Please sing's not for me. We were parted as friends. That's what I want. I don't want anyone feeling like they're not satisfied. Um, and you will be satisfied. And don't just take my word for it. If you just look up Trust Pilot and Blue Light, that'll tell you all you need to know. Um, and for those of you who have given me reviews already, thank you so much for them. They're just wonderful reviews. I can tell you put your heart and soul into them um, just for the progress that you've made so far. So there we go, folks. Um, that's the end of the evening, unless anyone's got any burning, burning questions. No, how was that session for you? Was it? Give, give me a. Is that right? Right. I'll take. I'll take some thumbs up. Brilliant. Well, listen. I look forward to seeing you on Thursday. Um, I really enjoyed this evening, although it's been a lot of me talking. Trust me, on Thursday we turn the tables, and it's you doing most of the talking. Similarly on Tuesday. Similarly on Thursday. Really interactive. We learn by doing, and that's what we're going to do for the next set of webinars. And if you're watching this on the replay. Thank you. If you've got this far, it means that you're serious. And if you want that big result, then come and join us. If you're that serious, come and join us. And I'll see you on Thursday evening, folks. Take care and bye-bye. Uh, bye-bye.